Well, hello there, and thank you for joining me for the latest edition of Telil 24-7. I'm your host, Adam Cook, and this week we're on location at the Nova Scotia Community College's Straight Area Campus in Port Hawkesbury. That's because last fall, this campus became one of two NSCC locations in different parts of Nova Scotia to host a year-long pilot project geared towards seniors. It's called CORA. That stands for Centre of Rural Aging and Health. And the CORA location here in Port Hawkesbury has been hosting a variety of activities since then. Everything from the CORA cafes, which welcome people in for a bite to eat and a cup of tea, but also special presentations by members of the community to be able to give seniors some advice on how to live their lives the fullest they can. And one of those presentations took place this week, specifically on the afternoon of Tuesday, January the 30th. It involved sleep habits for seniors and was presented by Michelle Greenwell. Some of you may remember her as a dance instructor in the straight area, and some of you may take the Tai Chi courses she offers, including right here at the Cora Center. But we're going to hear from Michelle Greenwell today about sleep habits for seniors, and we're devoting the entire program to what she has to say. So get ready to hear from Michelle in just a couple of moments. Right now, to set things up, here is the general manager of the Straight Area Campus, Cora Michelle McPhee. Welcome to Cora, everybody. We're the uh, Center of Rural Aging and Health. It's a new initiative at NSCC Straight Campus. It's an opportunity for older adults, 55 and above, to come out, learn, connect, socialize. My name is Michelle McPhee, and I'm the Administrative Coordinator for CORA on campus. And I think by the size of the crowd, we've identified an issue that's uh, important to all of us, so thanks to Michelle Greenwell for that. Um, we've just released our February CORA calendar, so if you'd like to get a copy of that, we have some here, and then at the entrance when you're coming in. We also have all of our information on our Facebook page. That's a great way to connect and keep up to date with all of our offerings. There's a lot of great opportunities to meet new people, learn new information, participate in workshops. And I did want to add that Michelle will be offering a excuse me, a continuation of this workshop series, the sleep workshop. It's a paid program that will be offered in February and March. So all the information will be found on that calendar and on our Facebook page. You'll notice that we also have Talil here with us today. So uh, Talil is a local broadcaster. They're from Arishat. You can find them in Arishat. They do a great job of coming out to community and finding what's happening, keeping people informed, and allowing opportunities for people to participate. So happy to have you. We're recording today for a future broadcast. And for those of you that are new to the building, washrooms are out in the lobby. They are on the back wall here. So if you wanted to take the stairs on that side or the ramp, exit that way, and they both take you into the main lobby. And okay, that's the reason that we're here today. So I'm looking forward to this workshop myself. I chatted with a few people today about the terrible sleep that I had last night. So grateful to have Michelle Greenwell with us today. She's got an incredible amount of skills and insights and she'll be sharing with us and um, yeah, for anyone who's ever struggled with sleep. So I came from a dance studio background where I was running my own studio, 300 some families and all of their children and their parents. A lot of stress, uh, performing, competing, traveling, and uh, my body took the brunt of that stress <coughs> and then uh, collapsed. So I lost the ability to walk, I lost the ability to speak. Um, I could speak with a microphone and I could teach from my bench and then I needed people to demonstrate for me. So I've rebuilt this body, not once but twice, because of course you learn some lessons and then you fall off the wagon and you have to learn your lessons again. So, uh, so I have a lot of experience with the tools that I'm going to be sharing. And they come to me, yes, I have a background in dance, but I also have a background in Tai Chi. And that wasn't really what I was doing at the time that I had my biggest challenges. But what I ended up finding was Touch for Health. And Touch for Health is I, it's an introduction into Chinese medicine and how the systems function and how the elements work. I also use neuroreflex integration. And I know that's a really big word. <laughs> what does that mean? It means how do the reflexes in the body that we're born with allow us to function in the best way? And our experiences and our patterns of how we live change those reflexes 
sometimes into patterns that are disharmonious for us in that they're not supporting our systems. So you're here today for sleep challenges. So if you think in terms of harmony, what is the harmony within the system that you may have or may not have that allows you to fall asleep easily and then to stay asleep? I wasn't satisfied with the knowledge that I had uh, coming from dance and um, movement-based pieces, so I spent the last 10 years going back to school, uh, older adult, doing a master's and then a doctorate. And it's in complementary and integrative health, and it's a way for people to think differently about their systems and how they function. So I'm hoping that helps shed a light on what my background is and how I might be able to support you. But now what I really like to do is find out about you and why you're here. So how many people have a sleep challenge that is persistent for them through the week? All right. And how many people have gone to find some kind of a solution and tried solutions that have worked for a little bit? Okay, how many people haven't found any solution? They just persist and carry on. Okay, more people. It's interesting, isn't it? And there's not really a lot of knowledge out there. Breathe deep, eat well, get plenty of rest, make sure you relax. All of us really do try to do that every day. We try to optimize. But what happens if we're not optimizing? And then how would you know? So let's dive in a little bit further. So I'm just going to refer to a few of my notes, just because I'm presenting my material in a slightly different way. So I want to make sure I get all the right pieces to it. So can some of you share with me what you've tried so far? It might have worked and it might not have worked. You can let me know that too. Yeah. I, my, my only problem really is getting up too early. <laughs> my only problem is getting up too early. I've always, I'm sure my mother loved me as a three month old baby because I was always up early. Uh, but I have no reason to be up early. I've tried to stay in bed, but I just can't. <laughs> and what time is early for you? Four o'clock, four thirty, five o'clock. Perfect. Perfect. So from three to five AM is when the lung is doing its optimum functioning. If it doesn't have what it needs, it can wake us up. And then we can't go back to sleep. Some people can. Some people wake up, think they have to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom, come back and then maybe can go back to sleep. But we wake up at the same time every day. But that can be one of the pieces. So long. Okay. So let's see what we can take from there then. What time do you usually go to bed? Usually about 10 o'clock, 10.30. Yeah. Okay. So if you are asleep by 11. Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> asleep before I th hit the pillow. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So which is for some people is a challenge to go to sleep. Right. Yours is just how long you're going to stay asleep for. And so if you're asleep between 10 and 10.30, by 4 o'clock you've already had six hours of sleep. So it's not bad, it's not quite enough, but it's not bad, right? Okay, perfect. Thank you for sharing that. Um, did you have something you were going to say? Okay, Kathleen's got something here. Okay, you wanted to know what I tried. Is this it? Yeah. For sleep? Yeah. Yeah. Try to relax by watching something silly on TV. Um, try reading. Sometimes I read does help for a while. I do the night and bog after a while, yeah. but I can't stay asleep. The only thing that really helps helps me somewhat is therapeutic touch. I give myself a therapeutic touch because it relaxes me. Yeah, but. Um, Persistent sleep loss is a problem for me. Okay, and in the evening, or in the night, how about how much sleep would you be getting? If I get six hours, it's really good. Okay, perfect. Doesn't happen very often. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, thank you. Okay, anybody else? 
So we're noticing, first off, that we have an imbalance in what's going on. <coughs> the muscles that run down the neck here have to do with the stomach system. So not necessarily your stomach itself, but the system that it's under. And so we can have a lot of digestive kind of challenges that will affect how that neck is going to function. So if there's an imbalance, that's one place that we can look. There are other places too, but that's a, um, one of the most basic. The other is the vagus nerve also runs through there. So your entire nervous system is uh, affected by how much tension you're holding in the neck. Okay, so let's see if we can make a change to that. So with this one, what I want you to do is take the same hand as here if you want, or you can cross over if you want to do some brain integration work. And I'm just going to go same side because it's easier for you to see me. So I'm just going to unroll the ear from the top to the bottom. So I'm just going to roll it and then bring it down. And then I'm going to go a little bit further in and just pull a little bit more, rolling out. Okay, I'm just trying to move so everybody can see me. All right, coming around, a little bit deeper on round three. Okay, and let's go to the other side and then roll that side. So now this can put your body clock on the right hour. So when I work one on one with clients, I can find out if their body clock is even in the right ballpark. Some people can flip by 12 hours. So if they've done a lot of shift work, like we were talking about, right? Shift work can completely flip your body clock so it thinks it's 3 a.m. when it's 3 p.m. And then in the middle of the night, it can think it's 10 o'clock in the morning and you're ready to get up. But your body clock just needs to be rewired. So the ear rub can be really helpful for that. There are other tools, too, that can go a little bit deeper, but that's a quick, easy one that's easy to remember. Anybody a musician in here? Any musicians? Oh, one musician. Okay. <laughs> that helps put you on the DVD. So for those people that might lag a little bit behind or have trouble finding the tune, sometimes that can really be helpful. So to dancers, that was always really valuable. Okay, so you've wrapped the ears on both sides. You might notice they're a little bit hot. That means we woke up all the systems in the body. I woke up mine so much that I now have a bright red face. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely heated up. Okay, so now what you want to do is turn your head and see if the head turn feels different or has changed in any way. And then try going the other way and see what that is. So what have you noticed? I noticed a loosening there. Okay, so there's some loosening. Anybody change how far they could see? Okay. So um, anybody notice that the balance between each side got a little bit closer to being equal? Okay. So what we did with the ear rub was we actually calmed the whole system down and we made a difference into function. So now if the, the neck muscles related to stomach system are now a little bit calmer, guess what's going to happen? Digestion is going to change. Digestion and stomach um, meridian, that's all when you process emotion. Anybody have any emotional baggage? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> <laughs> Any have any emotional baggage just to get through the day, right? There's a lot that has to be processed, and if that system is always in overdrive, then that can be a really big problem at the end of the day. All right, the stomach meridian, stomach and spleen uh, operate and function the best first thing in the morning. So how many people have a really good breakfast? Awesome, and you're eating between 7 and 9 a.m. <clears throat> How many people are eating later than that? <laughs> Some people don't feel like eating till noon, but then they have a really good breakfast. <laughs> okay, so that can make a difference on how the systems are functioning. So I'm hoping starting to put a light onto it's not just bedtime. 
that's the challenge. It's actually what are your habits and what are your patterns through the day because they lead you to bedtime and they lead you to what's going to happen with the future. Okay, the other piece that we did by rubbing those ears was we calmed the nervous system. So that vagus nerve is able to release and it goes and wraps around every organ. So if it's tight up here, you know there's going to be tension in other places. We don't know where it's going to be. We don't know what system's going to necessarily be challenged, although you probably have some kind of indications. But at least you know that there's going to be tension there, and it's a great way to calm. OK, so now if you go to turn your head again, I want you to notice what happens to the rest of the body when you turn. Those who are in my Tai Chi class, you'll know because we've done this before. But bear with me and see how far. Okay, so turn your head again and see what kind of rotation you notice. And if you go the other way. Okay, anybody notice that it wasn't just their head that was turning that time? So what we did was we integrated, it actually integrates all the way from your pelvis. So I know you're not sitting in the greatest of seats, and many of you are reclined back, so you're not really in a proper posture. So you'll have a limited effect. But from the hip, we get a full rotation that allows us to turn our head. And that's how our body functions as an integrated uh, body. Most of the time, we end up isolated. And that's just because we're tight and holding things. So when it's integrated, you get this lovely, went through the spine, everything wants to turn, and they're all engaged. All the muscles are working together and synchronizing. That's what you need before you go to bed. Just a reminder that you're watching Talil 24-7, filmed on location at the Nova Scotia Community College Straight Area Campus. Let's return to the NSCC Center of Rural Aging and Health, or CORA, and hear more from Michelle Greenwell's presentation on sleep habits for seniors. Hydration. So when I offer tea, how many people have that idea that if I have that tea, I'm going to have to go to the bathroom, and I don't want to miss the presentation? Right? Okay. And how many people try not to drink anything after 6 o'clock in the evening so they don't have to get up in the middle of the night to go pee? <laughs> right? Okay. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. So our body needs to be hydrated all day long, and our heart and our lungs and our detoxing systems need water in order for them to flush out the toxins. So if we don't give them any water, how are they going to do that? So really important is to make sure there's some water before you go to bed. And it may be that you add water in and you tear up three or four times peeing. But then you can celebrate and say, I can do that. I'm very happy about that. And eventually that disappears. But you have to give the body a chance to trust you that it's going to continue to have some hydration going on. Okay, so to check for hydration, you can squeeze on your hand the skin. And it should immediately just so if you squeeze and it goes flat, that means right now you're hydrated. But if you squeeze and the skin kind of slowly returns back to normal, then we've got some dehydration. If it stays up, then you know you've got some severe dehydration. Definitely need more. Okay. So how many people, it just went flat, no problems. Okay. How many people? It stayed up just a little bit. Okay, so more water is really, really important. The cells do not function without water. So they can't carry on their own energy building, but they also cannot communicate with other cells unless there's water present. So that's really important to have. And I know people will just say, we need to be hydrated. So how many people take water and just kind of guzzle it back. So if you go to the sink, fill it up, guzzle it back. Okay. 
the receptors in your mouth don't have time to catch the signal that you sent water in. So the water goes down into the stomach, the stomach goes, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this, and it just lets it go. So what you want to do is make sure, take a sip, swish it around in your mouth, receptors are going to say, oh, water is coming, and then take your time sipping it, rather than taking the whole thing back. And you've got those water bottles where you can squeeze them and you can just put the, go straight to the back, right? But the, the sensors are in the front, so you need to make sure you've got that water coming around in the mouth so you actually get it there. So now you put some water in and you want to make sure it gets to the right place. So we have this water spot on the body that helps to distribute more efficiently. So I'm going to share that one with you because that may be helpful. So one, you're going to improve hydration, and two, we're going to improve how it gets distributed. So you've got from the belly button to the xiphoid process, so where the ribs come out together, you've got halfway between. So if you find that point on you, give it a little rub and just see how it feels. Okay. So you may notice you rub it for a little bit, seems fine, and then all of a sudden it feels like it's a bruise in there. Anybody noticing that? Okay, that's saying I need more water, not enough water. Okay, so anytime there's a pain or an ache or a soreness, that's telling you it's signaling you from some system. All right, so if you keep rubbing that point, notice if that bruise <coughs> starts to disappear. So it's starting to lighten up, so some people are nodding their head. All right. So that lightness coming up is the systems have all talked to each other and they're starting to function in a better way. Okay, so that's really easy to put in there. Okay, so how many people drink water when they get up in the morning before they do anything else? How many people do it without their medication at the same time as that water? Okay. So there's a difference between. So one is you want the water to go in to flush out all those toxins from the night. But a lot of us, because some of the medications you have to have an hour before you eat, so you have to try to calculate how you're gonna get everything done in time. So you take all your medicine at the same time as the water. But now the water gets diluted with all that medication and it has a whole different system it's gonna go through. So hydration didn't really happen so much as distributing your medication. So if you have the opportunity to have your water first, let the body detox, get the toxins out, and then you go, okay, now I'm ready. I'll take whatever medication needs to happen now, and then I'll calculate from there. Okay. So how many people kind of get a lull in the middle of the afternoon, about two o'clock? Right about now. <laughs> Nap time, right, okay, so if you started with water in the morning and if you didn't really have too much water midday, by two or three o'clock in the afternoon is when the water element takes over, which is kidney and bladder. So what you're getting a signal is, there's not enough water in the system, I can't function, and we go, I think I'll add some coffee or some black tea or maybe some chocolate and I'll try to give a jolt to my adrenals and wake myself up. But if your body got some water, it would be able to distribute and it would be able to start to bring it back to balance. Okay, so some people are recognizing some patterns. Okay, all this leading up to how can I get better rest? So I just want you to kind of think about your day and kind of think about where the water gets distributed through the day. And I know for myself, if I get to my computer and get stuck there, it'll be one or two in the afternoon and I'll go, my goodness, four hours went by and I didn't get anything. Anybody recognize that pattern? <laughs> okay, so for me, if I make a cup of a pot of tea, I put the pot of tea on, Yes, it's going to be cold by the time I get to it, but it always is. But it's there. 
And then what I find myself doing is I just keep pouring. And then I just keep sipping. And it's my way of making sure I'm getting enough. And in that midday section, it gives me an opportunity to really be strong. The other thing I try to do is two glasses of water. I get up, go pee, two glasses of water. Make sure I've replenished. And in my previous life as a dance studio owner, I was severely dehydrated because I never took the time to have water while I was teaching, and that's an eight-hour day. And so what I started to do is every time I went to the washroom, I made sure I got another glass of water. And that was my pattern to make sure that hydration continued. Ray, you have something there? Yes. Does the pot of tea, is it near as good as a bucket of water? <laughs> That's a great question because there's a lot of different writings about that. If it was a black tea, the black tea would have caffeine in it, which would be a dehydrator. If it's an herbal tea, it's going to have herbs in it. If you're hydrated, adding the herbs means the body will be able to process as it can. But if you're dehydrated, it would be better to have water. A lot of people think, oh, well, I've been drinking tea all day. I don't need water. That's not right. If it's a black tea, you would be dehydrating all day long. Most tea is black, isn't it? No. But what most people recognize as tea here would be black. Yeah. yeah. Well, your boy doesn't want to be black. Yeah. 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 So that's a good point. The same with coffee, because coffee is also a dehydrator. And it's very often that's what we grab first. I know my sister doesn't function until she's had a cup of coffee in the morning, sometimes two. And my parents, when I last visited, uh, they, they said, uh, they had two cups of coffee. And I said, why are you drinking two cups of coffee? I said, we always do that. And I said, well, I remember coming to visit, and you would drink green tea and coffee was only on Sunday. No, no, that's not right. I think your memory's wrong. I said, mm, I don't think so. But they actually had, it had snuck in, and it had snuck in that much that those two cups before they did anything else. Anybody who does that? <laughs> okay, so it'd be something to think about. Can you change that? Maybe go to one cup first off, and then eventually see what you can, see what makes you happy. See what you can shift to that way. There's a pop, I suppose, would be a dehydrator, too. Oh, pop? Oh yeah, pop's lovely. <laughs> That's a whole other workshop. <laughs> so if you're looking at pop, depends on which pop, right? Because it could be pop that has everything in it, so you've got caffeine and sugar. Slow it up. Yeah, so it's going to make you go like this. Okay, that's what it's designed to do. The second part is some people will choose the non-sugar alternative, but that's aspartame in its various forms. And aspartame creates some really harsh detoxing challenges. So that can be also a challenge. And if you're dehydrated, it's going to be more. It just makes everything more. So that's why water becomes really important. Yeah. I have been switching. <laughs> Thank you for asking that question because it's an important one. Yeah. Is it very important to the other one take a glass of water and have a glass of water the first thing? Yes. Because all of the if you go liver, gallbladder, lung, and the other one I didn't talk about is large intestine. Large intestine is from five to seven AM. And that's where it takes the last of the water out of your out of what's come through the digestive tract and put it back into the system. If you were dehydrated, it has nothing to go back in. So there's no way for those toxins to get released. So I do two glasses of water first thing in the morning. And then I always know that in 20 minutes time, I'll be back in the bathroom, which is fine. But I know that I've, I've detoxed, I've got the water in, and then I can move myself forward from there. It's better going to the bathroom than you drop the water into the forward. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Should you drink ice water or room temperature water? That uh, in discussions and different writings, um, it's suggested that water should be room temperature because it'll be the fastest to be absorbed. Some people, my husband, he prefers it ice cold out of the fridge. I can't drink it that way. Um, but it's, it has to be converted temperature-wise. 
So it's going to take longer to get into the system. If you're hydrated, that's okay. But if you're not hydrated, it's going to slow everything down. So the second part to my question is, um, should it be like uh, bottom water or can you use tap water? You know? It could be one and the same. <laughs> because it depends what kind of bottled water you're using, right? Not all waters are equal, um, but most of the bottled water that you find is the same as what you have on your tap. Most of them. I enjoy ice water. And I, I kind of know that ice water is not, it's better to have it not lukewarm, no colder than that. Yeah. And, and cold water is okay, like I said, if you're hydrated. So it's just a matter of up to what you prefer. Yeah. What about carbonated water? Carbonated water turns it into an acid. So if you are already on the acidic side, which if there's any inflammation in the system, most of us, I'll be included, will have more acid happening in the body than we want. So then that you add to it. So what happens, what does the um, acid do to your body? It, it really makes inflammation accelerate. Yeah, you just don't, you need to have a balance um, to bring yourself back into a harmony. And so your pH, if it goes off into the wrong directions in different organ systems, then it creates more challenge, which results in inflammation. For the next segment of her Sleep Tips for Seniors session at the Center of Rural Aging and Health at the NSCC Strait Area Campus on Tuesday afternoon, Michelle Greenwell offered some advice about breathing and stretching techniques. If you sit most of the day, breathing may be smaller. So in a day, what kind of breathing might you have? Do most of you breathe kind of center of the chest? Some of you breathe and you notice that your shoulders go up and down. Does anybody notice they have really small breaths? Okay. Anybody with sleep apnea? Okay. Anybody who notices when they lie down, their sleep, their sleep, their breathing pattern changes. Okay. And anybody who takes a breath in, every time they take a breath, their entire ribs move and expand. Anybody lucky enough for that? <laughs> I can do it if I'm focused on breathing. <laughs> and I know that's where it should be. If I'm practicing Tai Chi, it's instantly there. But in the middle of the day when I'm busy doing something, I'm probably back at that more shallow kind of breathing. Okay. So what we want to look at is what is your breathing pattern and how much movement are you doing because that affects how much breathing you're doing. So how many people raise their arms over top of their head throughout the day? Constantly. Hmm. I walk around like this. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. How many people do activities throughout the day that had you turning from side to side. Sometimes, every so often. <laughs> okay. And how many people notice their diaphragm raising and lowering? So in order for the body to function really well, the diaphragm has to move. If you're seated most of the day, it's not moving. Going to be, it's going to be micro movements with your breathing because it needs you to be moving in order for it to move efficiently and big enough. So if you look at all the time across the day and how much time you spend sitting and how much time you spend standing and doing movements that take your hands over your head, um, would you say you sit probably 80% of your day Okay, those of us who get stuck at our computer. And then how many people maybe 60% of the day? Okay, how many people are sitting for 40% of their day? Okay, 
If you have a good book, then that's it. You're done for the whole day. You're there. Okay, so what's really important is this action is going to change everything going on in here. I'm not saying you need to spend all day doing this, but the activities that you choose to participate in are going to change how the diaphragm is functioning. And that's going to change what kind of breathing you use all the time. And that's important when you go to bed. Thank you. All right, so let's try something. Take a breath in, see what it feels like. See how much oxygen got in there? Okay, and now what I want you to do is tap from your shoulder to your palm. Three times. And then let's do the other side. Now take a breath in again and see what it feels like. It was better. Did it go deeper? Okay. So that little action allowed more oxygen to go in. So your efficiency of how much air is going in, even while you're sitting here now, isn't as much as it could be because we made that significant change. So how you breathe throughout the day is really going to affect what you feel like when you get to bed. So if you were breathing really shallow all day long, <laughs> you crawl into bed, it's not going to get deeper. You might snore, <laughs> but it's not going to be a nice deep breath because the body has been functioning with shallow breathing all day long. So we need to really change how the breath is being worked throughout the day. And that can change then how your sleep is going to happen because your body will, can go into that deep sleep. The sleep apnea challenges, some people actually breathe backwards. So my husband, he would go to take a breath and instead of the diaphragm dropping, his would actually go up. You can imagine how much oxygen is going to go in then. Not very much. And then when he went to release the breath, it was completely opposite. Then you have people who breathe quickly. So he's a great example. Because <laughs> I crawl into bed, I hit the pillow, and I'm out. But he crawls into bed, and his breath is very quick and not very deep. So then when you think about what kind of restful sleep might you have, it's going to depend on the kind of breath that you're able to provide with them. So this is really helpful because that can open things up and you could do that all the way through the day. If you did that before bed, you may notice that that might give you a little bit more. This is Adam Cook and you're watching Telil 24-7, filmed on location at the Center of Rural Aging and Health at the Nova Scotia Community College's Strait Area Campus. Let's return for the final act in the presentation being delivered by Michelle Greenwell on sleep habits for seniors. You can put them on the back like this. Curl yourself up, and the blood from the back of the brain will go to the front of the brain and will just calm the system down. If you have somebody who can't sleep, you put your hand on their forehead. That can be very quick and helpful for them. Somebody was talking about newborn babies. <laughs> it can be very helpful too. And you can do it also with fingertips here. So if you need a few minutes at your desk, Middle of the day, you want to get that deep breath in, put your fingertips here, you'll notice immediately that breath is going to change. Awesome. Okay, so I want to just bring a couple of ideas as to how we could make a change. I've given you some ideas, but you can imagine it's taking you your lifetime to be able to have the beautiful sleep patterns that you currently have. So they're not going to change like that. Some things will change like that, but there'll be other things that are going to hold on. And there are some things that you may not even realize are there. So I'm just going to plant some ideas, and which is why I'm going to move to a, a four-blocked um, sleep workshop series. But I didn't put it one week after the other. I actually spread it out because it gives you the opportunity to go and experience some of the different techniques and tools and see how it makes a difference for you. 
It may work for you, it may not work for someone else because everybody has a different challenge, right? So just to give you some ideas. So if you have your eyes open at the moment, notice how your body feels. Notice how your neck might turn at the moment. We rubbed our ears a while back. Now close your eyes and turn your head and see how that changes. Anybody notice that the range of motion got smaller? Okay, so that indicates that when you close your eyes, your body gets stressed out. That can be the person who has trouble going to sleep or the person who has trouble staying asleep. Because the body thinks when the eyes are closed, you're not safe. So we can flip that. Okay, so that would be something that you might want to look at. Then if we go to trauma, you were, oh, lying on the couch and your brother or sister came and pounced on you one day while you were watching TV and you were like six. And then they pounced on you and you were lying straight back but your head was slightly up on a bigger pillow. That pounce went into your system. You got angry. You guys had a big row. Your parents came and said, that's it, to your rooms. You didn't get to finish watching your TV show. Lots of trauma in that. But what the body remembers is when you were lying flat on the couch with your head slightly propped up, you weren't safe. Now you go to bed, you lie down in the same position, you put your head on a pillow that's the same height, and your body recognizes it, it goes, you're not safe and then you come to alert. So we need to look at, are there some patterns of the way that you lie down, the way that you maybe roll over, where the body is recognizing times when you're not safe. So that would be something to look at. Again, these are things that you would never even think about, and they're crazy things, because you would remember being pounced on and the fight broke out. You remember how well you got along with your sibling, that's all you needed to remember, right? Okay, then we have, we've already talked about some different pieces for nutrition. There are some things that might be a pattern that you have that happens at supper time. Might be in the middle of the day, we've talked a lot about hydration, but there's also what you snack on before bedtime, how much you ate, what kinds of foods you were eating, whether your body was energized by that food or whether you had energy removed from your body because of that food. So it's a different way of looking at things. So some of you are thinking about the snacks that you like to have. The bed lunch. Cape Breton has bed lunch. We never heard of that out west. <laughs> <laughs> if you go to the neighbors for bed lunch, you know it's very insulting if you don't eat. <laughs> so there's some different pieces in there that some habits that might be there that um, we could look at and be able to adjust. Okay, anybody have tinnitus? Anybody listen to CBC yesterday? <laughs> I was wanting to yell into the, the piece. I have something, I have something, but anyway. So tinnitus might be something you lie down and then you get that buzzing in your ear and you can't go to sleep because you've got that extra sound in there. So being able to look at some different activities that you can participate in might be able to change that. Okay. Um, anybody with restless leg? Yeah, okay. Or even just the pain shoots down the leg, the hip doesn't like the position you're sleeping in, the extra pillow isn't yeah. working. Okay, so there's a lot of postural pieces that can also hinder how much sleep and what it's like, what kind of quality. So we can look at that and there's some really simple movement patterns that can change all of that. So that might be something that's of helpful uh, tools for you. We talked about sleep routine, so finding T 
keys that actually are going to support you to calm. But you can see there's a lot of parameters. You can buy that tea that says sleepy tea, but if you have all these other things going on, sleepy tea has, you know, it's got a really big job to try to save you after all the other stuff. <laughs> so it'll definitely help if we're able to address some of the other pieces. But also there's combinations of herbs that work really well together that your body might be looking for that could be helping those systems do their detox. And that might be what your body needs more than just calming. So we can look at some of that. Different times of the night when you get up, when you don't, making sure you're hydrated so that you have enough water in the system. Yes, you might have to get up, but it sure changes life when you say, I have the privilege of getting up. I have a toilet to get up to. Some people do not have that. Can you imagine going back to the outhouse? Right? Or there's no toilets at all. That's a whole other thing. So you think, I have these privileges and I'm lucky enough that I can do that. That changes then how you feel about when you get up in the night because your body is really trying to do its best to function for you. Okay, so first tip. We did ears. Okay, so that could be helpful. The second tip. Water, water point. Okay, making sure you rub your belly for that water point. And the third tip, down the arm. Sweet. So, yeah, one, two, three. And number four, which wasn't in my notes, but I gave it to you anyway. Hands on the hip. So, I was trying, how can you remember when you get home? So, you got ears. Belly, arm, lung to thumb, fingertips on the forehead. All right, those are a great way to start, a great way for you to make a difference. So what I'd like to do now is open it up. We have lots of conversation through. And if there's any other questions, I'd like to uh, help you with what I can. I have a sleep apnea machine too, and uh, my brother has one, and he, he doesn't have a good one, he can't sleep. No. It doesn't bother me if I have it or I don't have it, I don't even know the difference. Yeah, that's really lucky because it's true, but if you don't have really good breathing patterns, then your body can be quite stressed out in trying to go to sleep. So that machine does make a huge difference. Yeah. Should you still be doing breathing activities to try to increase your capacity and change the way you breathe? Absolutely. Because you want to be as best as you can be so that machine works the very best for you as well. Yeah. Uh, I know that some people take melatonin. What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's, uh, that's not an area of expertise for me. Um, I try to do everything energetically. So um, if it's something that works then, and it's been you know, recommended to you, then that's great. Yeah. How often can you do the air rub? I do it a lot. Yeah, and when I don't use it, I actually notice the difference. So, you know, first thing in the morning is really nice. Uh, before bed would be great. Middle of the afternoon when you hit the low, this could be very helpful. Um, or sometimes, like, oh, I was traveling, or you're sitting in the car, you've been in the car for a couple of hours, you're in a bad posture. This is really great to, to bring that whole body back again. And it's easy, it's quick. Yeah, so I don't think you could do it too much. What are the exercises for the restless legs? Uh, restless legs, Tai Chi, the Don Yu. Seated to standing Don Yu is the best exercise possible. It's on my YouTube channel, so if you want to check that out, you can. And there are other ways that we can identify where in the spine the challenge is coming from, and we can actually target in. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely. I hear ivory soap on the uh, bottom of the bed also works really well. What is it? Ivory, ivory soap. soap. <laughs> the bottom of the bed. So I never did that like myself. A bar of soap? Yeah. A box or a bar? A bar of soap. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> the whole box. <laughs> yeah. But from a movement perspective, it's an energetic block and it's that shooting electrical that's coming through. So what you really want to do is move it so that it's no longer there for you. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, everyone.
You brought a lot, and I appreciate that the contributions and the pieces. And uh, if you have any questions, my card is over on the side. Please take it. My resources are there. And uh, if you use my link tree, goes link tree dance debut on that one. And if you go in there, then the resources are all listed, and you can just click away and go search for what you'd like to search for. And I am absolutely thrilled with all that Cora has been able to offer because Fridays to come and do Tai Chi here is wonderful. And we have a project with CBU that's in Judic. Um, and the two are working together to maximize how much time people can spend really getting some good quality movement in. So, so if any of that's helpful to you, please come and participate. We'd love to have you. And there you have it. That wraps up this week's special edition of Telil 24-7 on location here at the Nova Scotia Community College Straight Area Campus. Thank you for tuning in and a special thank you to the presenter at the Cora event held earlier today, specifically Michelle Greenwell. And thank you to Michelle McPhee, the general manager of Cora, for helping to set up our visit here today. If you have any comments about what you've seen over the past hour here on Telil 24-7, or you'd just like to make some suggestions for a future edition of the show, I'd love to hear them, you can contact me directly. My phone number is 902-625-8863, and you can reach me by email using the address adamjrcook, cook with an e, at gmail.com. You can also contact Talil Community Television directly with your suggestions and your comments. The station phone number in Arishat is 902-226-1928, and the best email address to use is telil at telil.tv. As always, you can follow Telil on social media. We're on X, formerly known as Twitter, as well as Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Our Telil YouTube channel features every single episode of Telil 24-7, including this one, as well as our sister program, Roundtable, and special segments and interviews from each of these shows. And be sure to tune in to our Telil YouTube channel for several great new French language journalism programs created by the newest member of the Telil news team, Jacqueline Gerouard. For now, I'm Adam Cook. Thank you once again for joining me for this special edition of Telil 24-7. I look forward to seeing you again next time with a brand new show. Bye for now.